So I don't think there's any debate that we are living in a very purple patch of amazing cycling on TV and streaming services. So we wanted to sit down and get a behind the scenes description of what goes into putting a right race on TV with commentators, with guys on motorcycles like you, Jens. Um, so we had a great talk today with Rob Hatch. Jens, you're also in the commentary business, maybe as a play-by-play -play or as an expert, not necessarily the lead commentator. So what did you think of today about our, our chat with Rob? It was absolutely awesome. It gives a lot of insight also to people who never heard of this before, how much work it goes into it. He not just has a talent for it, he's also a hardworking man. I loved every minute of it. Yeah, I, I'm blown away that you can have that sort of tone, that sort of excitement sitting in your living room commentating remotely. So sit back and relax and enjoy our conversation with Rob Hatch. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Rob Hatch to Bobby and Jens. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, gentlemen. Wow. I tell you, you know, I, I just started watching Ted Lasso and I love your <laughs> microphone. You know, our listeners can't see it, but the people watching this definitely can. So you, I'm going to call that the Ted Lasso mic. But man, thank you so much for coming on. I know you're constantly commentating and you're actually working the tour of Burgos right now, right? I am, yes. I'm probably com commentating probably too much for some people's taste. But uh, yes, if they're watching the World Cup Burgos this week, they'll be hearing me. Happy for some people, maybe unfortunately for others. That's the name of the game, isn't it, in this game? <laughs> and you've got to give me a little heads up with um, how this all works. Like, I would, if, if I would assume, I'd say, okay, he's at the Vuelta Burgos, you know, a week and a half before the Tour of Spain because he likes paella and tapas. <laughs> um, but you're you're not there. You're working from home, correct? Well, I am in Spain, if that makes it easier. I okay. actually live in Spain. I live in Spain. Um, I've been coming and spending time here and speaking the like, well, learning the language since I was 17, actually, on and off. I went to the Canary Islands when I was 17 to do a summer job. And I can't say I didn't go home because I sort of did. And I ended up living a bit everywhere and getting into commentary and being very, very lucky. But yeah, I've moved back to Spain now and um, I am here, but I'm not in Burgos. It's not a place I know well, actually. And this is probably killing one of the commentary secrets for a lot of people now who are listening. But the as Jens will know as well, we don't go to every race anymore. That's uh, That's the way things are. I mean, you could use many bits of reasons as to why that is, doesn't happen. The main thing is cost. It costs a lot of money to send people to different places. And I think that's a secondary concern now that, that is more on vogue every day. Certainly this summer in Europe with the temperatures we've been having, it, it's probably um, a climate thing as well. You know, I don't think it's if, if we don't need to be there, then is it necessary to send people there? Uh, obviously, I'm always going to put my hand up and want to go because that's the part of this job that I've always fallen in love with traveling and seeing new places. And I think as bike riders as well, although you don't get to see everywhere you go. We had those questions being asked in the tour where the riders didn't know where they were, didn't they, in the middle of the Tour de France and things like that. But, but you know, when you can take it in, that, that's one of the first things I'll be doing. But no, I'm working at home. Uh, we use the internet. We use these Ted Lasso microphones that you're talking about. Um, they're actually these old, we call them a lip mic in broadcasting, a lip microphone. So the top of it goes where Ted Lasso's moustache would be, right on your top lip. And you speak into a shield just in front of it. I mean, I remember it, and you guys won't remember this. I'll keep this reference very, very brief. But it, it reminds me of watching the cricket when I was a kid. And the Australian commentators always used to have these microphones. And, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s, you'd see some BBC person talking at Wembley in a football match in a very posh voice on one of these things. But seeing as I work from a home studio, it's the best thing for having the best quality sound. And, and I'm just used to working with them now. Would you think with a mic like that, famous Winston Churchill was giving the speech, all I can give you is blood, sweat and tears. Was he using the same mic? <laughs> he might well have it. It's probably an earlier version of it. Yeah, dearie me. I've never thought of that link, but there you go. My speeches are less important, Jens. 
<laughs> but um, 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 quick question back to the job. Um, another reason I could think of why we are not going anymore, because it's the same for me at Eurosport Germany, um, the teams these days are so professional and organized. And for example, for the Grand Tours, they bring sometimes two press officers. So the advantage of being there to talk to riders, get a little bit of insight, mm. is almost gone because like with some of the bigger teams, if you want an interview in the first week of the tour, well, you ask them in May and you send in the questions. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's not easy to get in like a prompt to interview. And that's, I, I believe, another reason why we're not going there. Or, uh, would you agree to that? I'd say it's one reason, yeah. I think it's important we send reporters and proper journalists to get the proper stories. But there again, as commentators, we aren't proper journalists. Aren't we? We're sort of a strange hybrid, I guess, between an entertainer and uh, somebody who's relating, getting into somebody's living room historically. Or nowadays with the app, you know, you're in someone's office when they're watching out the corner of their eye and pretending to the boss that they're not watching the cycling. Um, we're, we're conveying the message, aren't we, really? Um, there's an element of journalism to it. But it's important we send those people to get those stories because obviously the teams aren't going to always tell you what you know we want to hear, are they? But that is another reason, I imagine. It's funny, actually, guys, because in the last... Before the pandemic happened, the last couple of years, we were going on site less and less anyway because of the the economic factor, because it started to cost a lot of money, I think. And a lot of companies realized that, you know, I mean, let, let's, just, let's go back one and describe to the listeners exactly what happens, because cycling is a funny sport, isn't it? We can't sit on the back of a motorbike like you do, Jens, every stage and do the whole commentary from the back of a bike you're not you know people sometimes think oh you're following the tour de france and you're on the back of a bike no you're actually sitting in a box or a lorry at the end of the stage at the finish line so you see the race for what three seconds every day you actually see physically the race for about three seconds when you're on site maybe if you look at and even then if you call a sprint finish as the lead commentator i don't tend to look outside the window so much i'm watching the screen my expert, my ex-cyclist, Sean Kelly, whoever it might be, might be looking up and trying to see if they can see something extra. But mainly I'm, I'm talking to the pitchers because that's my job. So it's a funny one. Being on site anyway, <laughs> what did it bring to us? I think it brought a lot at the smaller races. You know, you could get the atmosphere, that extra 5 or 10%. I think the commentary is better on site. But again, people in charge have to wet up, don't they? Is it worth paying, you know, these thousands of extra euros to fly someone out there, pay for the hotel for 21 nights, the car, the transport, um, you know, the, the restaurants and all that sort of stuff? Um, I think I got a lot more out of small races like Paris-Nice or Tour de Romandie because you found yourselves in the same hotels a lot of the time as riders and coaches. And you could have a conversation and you might have a coffee in the morning or a beer in the evening and, and a little chat with a sports director and, you know, it was the days before kilometer zero broadcasting. So we might go to the start. Sean Kelly and I used to often go to the start of Paris Nice and have a chat and hang around the buses, you know, a bit like fans, really, just hanging around and waiting to see if we bump into somebody, certainly at the start of the season. And um, so I think that was important. But the way it is going now, I think the balance maybe has gone a little too far the other side. I'd like to go to some races again and I mean, we're all free. I'm, I'm a freelancer. I don't know about you, Jens, with, with Eurosport in Germany, but I make sure I do a small percentage of my work elsewhere so I can go on site and I can keep in touch. So I, I tend to work for the, um, the Belgian host broadcaster for the Spring Classics, for example, and I go to Belgium for a month. And I, I think that's really important to take into the rest of the season for me to, to have that connection, to have that knowledge. Man, there's just so many questions I have going through my head right now. But one of the things that you know, these riders that you're commentating on, they don't just show up at the race, right? They've got no. months and months of preparation for that race. Yeah. And I'm curious about what sort of preparation you have to do because, man, the names are constantly changing. There's so much to think about. What do you have like a, a template sort of preparation program that you go through if you're at the Tour of Burgos, the Tour of Spain, the Tour of France, or I don't know, Tour de Loise? Is it always the same or is there kind of tiered um, levels of preparation that you do? When I started, it always used to be the same. And I think the first thing I have to say in this respect is I think if you want to be good at this job, 
as a lead commentator. I'm not talking about, you know, you guys as the ex-bike riders. That is a slightly different job, isn't it? There's a different nuance to it. But as, a, as the lead commentator, I think you, ha- you sort of have to live the sport. You have to, it has to be your life. I don't think that's necessarily good for your health or your mental health at times because you could probably come a bit obsessed with it. But you have to live the sport to be very good at it, good at it, I think, um, to give yourself a chance of being good at it anyway. There's other elements that come into it that I won't go into now, such as having a strong voice. I think that's very, very important as well because, you know, you could be saying a lot of different things. But uh, if you don't have a, a strong voice that's going to get people's attention, then it's not really not working is it um i won't go too much into that now but in in response to your question i'll say the 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 biggest race that i prep every year is the giro d'italia one because it's my favorite race two because it's the first grand tour and it's the first time that you're going to see a lot of these riders that are in the giro there's going to be a lot of the chunk of racing over the early part of the season isn't it so you you're basically prepping whilst you're doing it the first half of the season that plus the classics I start my Giro prep, I don't laugh at me too much, but I start my Giro prep either in October or November before the Giro. Um, because I think it is really important to get on top of the route as soon as it comes out, talk about places, things like that. When the racing's good, it's a lot easier job <laughs> because you talk about what's in front of you. You ask the question of the expert who's next to you, you let the expert speak. Because to be honest, people aren't tuning in to listen to, to me or any other lead commentator talk about cycling. They listen to us ask the right questions about the cycling. Yes, we call the moments and I'm going to interrupt the expert when there's an attack. Because, you know, if you're watching the news in 20 years and you're celebrating somebody getting a lifetime achievement award, they're going to replay that attack, aren't they? Or that win. So you have to have the, the voice down and the, the call, as you guys in America say, it. you know, the call for that that particular moment. But when the, when the racing's happen, you get the best out of the expert. When it's a um, bloody boring stage, <laughs> for want of maybe a stronger phrase, um, you need to know a heck of a lot about the culture, the town, the wine they drink, the food they eat, which football team won last week, what's happening in the country, because a lot of people watch this sport, don't they, as, as sort of a travel log as well. And let's face it, that's why we have bike racing, to advertise countries and areas and tourist boards so yeah i begin in october november for the giro and then i what what i do is is do a big document for each race so i work firstly on the history of the race which is the advantage of doing it for year upon year because that doesn't change too much that's the portion of the prep that stays the same and you might make one or two additions each year then i'll do a section in the document about each stage where they pass through where the sprint is things that might have happened here before, you know, when Marco Pantani attacked, blah, 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 whatever. Um, might remember stories from when we are on site. Sean said this, I did that. We drove here, we stayed in this hotel, whatever. And then afterwards, the, the thing that comes the last in the document is the riders because, of course, the teams aren't selected until two weeks before. You have an idea, don't you? Everybody does in cycling. If you follow it close enough, who's going to go? But with the, the team announcements, it's normally a frantic week and a half 10 days of putting the names and anecdotes in so that's the race prep and then on top of that gents i'm carrying on boring you guys here with this i'm sorry but just to finish the point off for the listeners i generally do a document every winter as well about each rider so i have something to say about them throughout the season if i'm stuck for something wow you are a true professional (laughs) um i would like to go 10 15 years back when did you ever develop your love and interest for cycling? How and when and, and how did that happen? And when did it first time cross your mind, hey, I could be a commentator on this? It's a good question to ask somebody like me because I'm from the northwest of England, which isn't exactly a cycling hotbed until very recently. Um, now, of course, we have the Yates brothers and Hugh Carthy and people like that. But yes, I grew up watching football and cricket or so soccer, cricket. They were my sports when I was a kid. I loved them. And I enjoyed traveling abroad. And it's only really when I was going to Spain in my teens um, that I started to see this thing called cycling and watch it and come into contact with it. So I came into contact with it late. Obviously, I knew about the Tour de France. Everybody knows about the Tour de France, don't they? You see the highlights on the TV, but I never really knew how it worked. Um, I had no reason to know how it worked because I just never really come into contact with it. I rode a bike like all kids ride a bike. I love riding my bike, but not in the way that, you know, I ride a bike now and 
um, I, I follow it. So it was it was the interest, really. It, it was the cultural thing for me. It was going to the, you know, the hotbeds of the sport, really, Spain and Italy, especially, and, and falling in love with with that sport there. And and commentary came came after I actually started my broadcast career. I started as a football commentator. Like most people do, I think, in, in lead commentary, it's certainly in Europe, it's just it's something that everybody does. You know, if you, if you can commentate, it's probably the easiest sport to commentate on. And, and it was my first love as, along with the cricket. So yeah, I did a lot of football commentary. I've done volleyball, beach volleyball. Um, I've been at the Olympics and the Paralympics, which conversely, I think is really important to, to do different sports if you want to be a good lead commentator in any sport, because it just gives you that bit of versatility, certainly in a sport like cycling, where, I mean, Jens, think back to the World Championships last week. You know, um, we were on air, you were on in Eurosport Germany, I was on in, in English language. And what happened? We had 55 minutes without any racing. <laughs> Um, not going to go into the whys or whatevers because we still don't really know the whole story of what happened there. But we suddenly had 50 minutes to fill. And I think it helps if you're a general all-round broadcaster to steer the conversation and, and just fill the time without panicking, really. Well, I mean, I am totally impressed with your level of preparation. But I've listened to you many, 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 many times. This is the Sorry. first time that I can actually put a face <laughs> with the voice but one of the things that not ever meeting you before i don't believe that stands out is your pronunciation of names of start towns of finish towns of everything so it has me thinking how many languages do you speak in order to get this pronunciation so spot on um, in, speaking fluently, three plus a little bit of English. I mean, my English is pretty weak since I'm from Northern England. Um, <laughs> okay, so Italian, because you say Marco Pantani, like... Yeah, know, Italian, uh, French, uh, although my French is nowhere near as good as it used to be when I... I mean, I lived there for a little bit when I, you know, I, I, uh, I began working at Eurosport. I spent a year and a bit there. I, I studied French, Italian and Spanish at university. Um, so I have a degree in, in, in those three languages. Uh, I now speak a little bit of Catalan because I live in, in the Balearic Islands now. Um, and I'm very lucky to speak Spanish with a, I say lucky, <laughs> with a thick Canary Islands accent because I learned in Gran Canaria when I was 17 years of age. And it sort of stuck because I, I was with a family that didn't really speak English. So I learned like a baby learns. You know, you learn the sounds and things like that. So I, so I had to learn the language. And then when I went to university, I had to brush up on the grammar. So... <laughs> It was the opposite way around, really. Uh, so they're the languages. But I think the Latin languages, when you speak one or two, the rest come pretty easy in terms of learning how to pronounce something or reading. And so I could, you know, the Portuguese, for example, is pretty easy or Romanian. You can you can get through an article about cycling and you can more or less learn how to pronounce a word. And I mean, with the pronunciation thing, I, I know people, it's one of the things that people notice because maybe it's not been done so much in the English-speaking world before, but in the English-speaking world, we tend to be quite lazy, don't we? Because everybody speaks our language. I mean, you know, I, I've travelled around the world and been to many countries that I don't speak the language, so I can count myself as, as one of those people. But I think it's always, it's just a respect thing. You know, if I, if I go to a country, I'll try and learn please and thank you or whatever and you know, I might, I might absolutely murder it and be horrible at it, but it, it, I think it's the trying that's important. And I'm sure there's a lot of words I've got wrong. German words, I'm sure I've got a lot of German words wrong. But if somebody tells me the right way, I'll try and learn it because I just think it's the most respectful thing that, that you can do. If, yeah, I just imagine that somebody's mum is watching or somebody's friend or whatever. And, you know, I, 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 I'd find it very, very... You know, it's different if you're the, again, it's different if it's you guys, the ex-cyclists, because you, have, you are there to provide the expert technical commentary. My job, literally, is to get these people's names right. And I think a lot of colleagues don't really understand that part of the game, but a lead commentator's job is to get it right. And is it true that back in the days when we used to go on site, you wouldn't actually walk up to a team or to a rider, hey, excuse me, your name seems to be a little less ordinary how do you pronounce it did you ever ask people directly or how the team name sponsors are pronounced if i had the opportunity yes um not always i said you know 
you know what it's like. You might be all in 10 different hotels. It's not always easy that you get the opportunity. But if I had the opportunity to, yes. And if not, that there's always a way to find out. Very, very rarely is there no way to find out. I mean, there are some that leave you stumped. But, I mean, a good technique is a little cheap for anybody who wants to have a look. Just type in someone's name into YouTube and find an interview in their native language or a news article and wait until you hear the name. And you'll hear the presenter say the name or something like that. And at least you can have a guess at it, can't you? Um, and then obviously, you know, in cycling, we have other languages that I don't speak like, you know, uh, Dutch. Obviously, there's so many Belgian names, so many Dutch names. So you end up not learning the language, but you learn the phonetics. So you try and learn how something sounds in in, in the, so a lot of the Dutch names I pronounce will sound Flemish because that's the, the that's the phonetics that I use. I find it a bit easier to pronounce than the names in in the pure Dutch language. So, yeah, I, th I just think that uh, it's worth the effort, isn't it? And it, it's the polite thing to do if you if you get the chance. Yeah, you're you're kind of calling me out there because I basically have to have our producer Mark Sorry, or Jens help me with the pronunciation of our guests' names quite often. But but, but you try though. I... If if they tell you you try, that's fine. That that's the issue I'm getting at. It, it's it's the oh I can't do it and I'm not going to try that that annoys me. I don't re I don't mind people getting it wrong. I you know, a lot of people in here in Spain just call me Roberto because they struggle with Rob. It's a the 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 B flat sound the B you know, ending without anything after it is a lot of people struggle in, um, in Spanish with that. But, you know, as long as you try, that's the main thing. I try. It just takes a couple times. And then Jens and Mark are like, you're saying it exactly the same. You need, it's like this. So one quick question, the gentleman who won the Tour de France the last two years, oh, please pronounce wow. his last name because it is an ongoing debate. It is over here. I have it as well, if I'm allowed to see. But go, Rob. Go, Rob. Well, I'm going to preface this with the fact that the Danish names I have discovered on it. And again, this this is one of the wonderful voids of discovery of commentating cycling at the minute. I didn't realize that Danish names were so complicated. And that off the record, I've talked to other people from other parts of Scandinavia. And they've laughed and said that, oh, my God, yeah. You know, they don't even say it properly. And <laughs> I guess it's like a, someone from Northern England complaining about somebody from Texas talking or something like that. You know, it's just different, different ways of saying things. But anyway, I'm going to go with and uh, I've tried to practice this because apparently it is very peculiar. Uh, Jonas Vingegor. Jonas Vingegor. OK. Yeah, yeah I would also I would go pretty close. I would say Jonas Vingegor. I would give a little bit more to the D in the end. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm right. I, I just feel like, but yeah, it's not being a guard. It's war, oh. being a guard, yeah. being a guard. Okay. I think I think you are much closer to the other Scandinavian languages there. They 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 would say they pronounce it right, but obviously, you know, the guy's Danish, so we we go with we go with how he says it. <clears throat> You're from the UK. You now live in Spain. Mm -hmm. Why is the Giro d'Italia your favorite race? Oh. Everything about it, the way it looks, the, you know, even the color of the jersey, man. Just everything's boring compared to the Maliarosa, isn't it? You know, every race has a yellow jersey now. Um, no, just just the culture and what it means to people. I think when you go to the Giro, you, you, it feels different. Yeah, it feels small in the Tour and, and in a good way as well now. I mean, the Tour's become this massive, massive beast, hasn't it? That's crazy. And um, if I actually had to pick to go back to a race on site, I'd prefer to go to the Giro on the tour, honestly. Um, the food's better. I, f I find the country absolutely fascinating. Um, not that my trips around France haven't been interesting. They certainly have. I've been to parts of France that you know, I never knew existed. Uh, but it's, there's just something about Italy. I think there's, there's one explanation for it. I know, I know it's not. I'm not giving you a fantastically reasoned explanation here that's going to enlighten people, but um, it something that tugs on the heartstrings a bit. When I was a kid, stock teenager, mid to late nineties, again I told you I was a big football fan, um, and all of the Premier League was on pay TV. It was on satellite TV or cable, as you guys in America would say. Um, so I couldn't watch it unless I went to, to my dad's house who had cable. Me and, me and my mum at our house, we didn't have, we only had normal free TV. But on Sundays, there was one match from the Italian Football League on free TV. And at the time, it was the best football league in the world. Serie A, you had all the AC Milan, Inter, Samp, Fiorentina. 
fantastic Juve. teams. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's a bit of a swear word in my house. I lived in Florence for, for a year. And <laughs> there's a bit of an go. enemy thing going on there. But yes, yes. Um, the just, I don't know. And, and it harks me back to that. There was a fantastic broad, uh, broadcast made every week. And the guy used to sit there and he used to show you the, the, the pink Gazetta dello Sport and he'd read the headline and translate it for you. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's one of the things actually that got me into broadcasting in general as well. So perhaps it has a root in that. And also the Giro was the first big race that I got the opportunity to work on. So I think the Giro for me over the tour, even the Vuelta, even though I've, I've you know, I'm, for all intents and purposes, I'm sort of half Spanish. I don't don't have the papers, but culturally, I would say I've, I've spent more than half my life on and off here. So, um, so yeah, even more than the world, I'd say Giro for me. And also, maybe you as a Brit, you're probably a coffee, uh, not, not a tea drinker, but Oof, Italian no. coffee is also a lot better than anywhere else. In yes. Italian, the worst coffee is bloody awesome, and then it just gets better from there. The worst you can find, it's still awesome. Then it just gets better. So good coffee, right? Whenever I come out of arrivals in an Italian airport, the first thing I'll do is head to the bar, even before leaving the arrivals. There's one in Linate in Milan. I'm sure you've all flown in for Lombardia and races like that before. And it's, you know, small airports, close to the city in Milan. And, and straight when you walk through arrivals, it's like five meters, five paces from the, the arrivals door to the, to the bar. And a bar in Italy is somewhere that serves coffee. It's not like somewhere you think, you know, it's not like going to a pub or anything like that. A bar in Italy is, is somewhere that serves coffee, really. And yeah, I, again, I was born and raised in the UK, but culture, I think I'm much more Mediterranean by now. Certainly with the time I've spent there. And, um, and yeah, definitely coffee over tea any day. I, I don't even have a tea bag in the house. I'll get some in if my parents are visiting or something like that, or friends, but there's no tea bags here, mate. That's funny. That's funny. Um, another question that I have that I'm always curious of is, you know, in the sport of cycling right now, the entire Peloton is talking about fueling strategies mm. because they have to be on it. The racing is much more aggressive and much more consistent that's, than it's ever been. But you have to be on it as well. You have to have stable energy and mental focus. What is your nutritional strategy around commentating when you're on the air for four to six hours a day? It's probably a shambles, Bobby. That's what it is. An absolute shambles. Um, it's probably a heck of a lot more sugar than it should be. A lot more coffee than it should be. And I probably would not like to have a blood pressure test during the big part of the season. Uh, I would probably not want to know that or maybe have to retire tomorrow. Um, It's funny. It's funny. And, and Jens will know this because, you know, Jens, you started commentating even when this was changing. But the job has changed so much in the last five to six years, ever since this kilometer zero broadcasting came in for a heck of a lot. It's just a completely different rhythm today now. Whereas the race I'm doing today at the minute, Vuelta Burgos, is much more like it used to be. You do like the last two hours of the stage and the rhythm of the day is different. You probably have a proper meal. You do your research in the morning. You might go out and do some exercise. A bit more of a healthy existence. Um, but now during a Grand Tour, we're in sort of a darkened room all day. You don't really see any sunlight until afterwards, if you can get out and go for a bike ride in the evening or um, a run or something like that. But even then you're thinking about grabbing some dinner because you've not eaten properly. This goes back to your question. And then doing research the next day, it, it is nonstop now. So meals, I think it's really important because the fueling strategy, as you put it, is so shambolic now. It's really important to have a nice evening meal and a sit down meal and have a glass of wine or a beer or whatever you do to wind down. You know, everybody's different. Um, no, I try to make sure exercise and an evening meal are like the two sacred things for me if I can when I'm doing a grand tour. Um, I can't manage it every day for 21 days because you might have too much work to do or it might be raining outside or whatever. Um, but whether I'm at home or in the office uh, or on a rare occasion on site, I think those are the most important things. And food, I could tell you, for example, at the weekend with the Worlds, I was very lucky to get a break actually because Dan Lloyd did uh, about an hour and a half in the middle leading the commentary so I could go and have a nice little break. So that helps a heck of a lot. Um, but even so, you know, it's not like you can sit down and have a, a proper meal or anything like that. Um, 
it, it, it's uh, it's not easy, is it? So usually it's crisps, chocolate, coffee, all the unhealthy things. Um, and yeah, something that we probably should think about a little bit more now working at home for a lot of the season. Well, another thing to add to that is also a few years ago, we would have commercial breaks. So you would have three minutes where actually could, okay, I quickly run to the restroom, yeah. get a coffee and get a little sandwich. Now, when the public channel goes on commercial, you keep commentating on the pay version or on GCN Live. So it's no more break. So you actually, if you don't not sit next to your colleague, if, if he is in another city, we have that sometimes in Germany, you, you then send him a WhatsApp. Hey, in 38 seconds, I need to go <laughs> to the restroom so that he wouldn't ask you a question while you are actually not on your seat. Or you eat incredibly fast because you stuff an entire sandwich in your mouth and you scull it down with tons of coffee to only have 35 seconds and then you'll be back commentating. So eating quiet and healthy with a bit of culture, it's just out of the window, right? Isn't it, Rob? You have to make a real effort to eat healthy. I mean, Sean Kelly and I during the Giro, we were working in the in the office in um, in Bath. We were seeing you actually on FaceTime, weren't we, Jens? Uh, when we were commentating <laughs> yes. together, you guys were in London and we were we were in the GCN offices in Bath. And one of the, and again, the, one of the reasons we were down there actually and not in London is we could stay like three minutes from the studio, and then we could get out on our bikes in the evening. And it was just that having having that rhythm to the day that was actually a bit healthier for a grand tour. You know, we could go out for a bike ride, we go out for a meal, and then, you know, we might be able to nip and grab something at lunch where we had a bit of a break. And if we did, then usually it's a sandwich or something like that. But on the odd occasion, you know, you make something in the apartment in the evening and then bring it in the next day and maybe think about having a salad once every month or something like that. Uh, <laughs> it's... It's very, very difficult. And and in terms of the comfort breaks and, and the commercial breaks, again, th this job has changed so much in the last five to six years. And it's no sob story. It's just a dif different way we work and things to get things to get used to, isn't it? But yeah, the the, the nip into the toilet thing is an interesting one. Um, it's usually making a sign on FaceTime. And, you know, ask, in my case, as the lead commentator, asking a really long question so that somebody's going to give me a really long answer and they're making the signal and make it a long answer. I'll be back in 30 seconds. <laughs> Well, I mean, c correct me if I'm wrong, Yenzi. I believe that Rob is our first lead commentator that we've had on our podcast. We've had Christian Vanneveld, we've had David Miller, we've had Stephen Roach, uh, um, Nicholas Roach. Uh, you're obviously, you know, kind of a play-by-play -play guy or you know, a, an expert. But when it comes to being the lead commentator, um, what sort of like now I want to get into that your your man cave, because I've seen Christians. Uh, Jens has told me a little bit about his setup, but like, what is your setup? Do you have multiple screens, one big screen? You already said you're sitting in there in the dark. Do you have like I don't know padding around the room so that if somebody you know rings the doorbell, you can't hear? What what? Tell us a little bit about the technical um, setup that you have there. I've had to change it in the last few months. I actually bought a flat a few months ago. I actually decided to grow up at the grand old age of 39. How about that? Um, I, was, I had a house during the COVID pandemic. And this, obviously, that's when a lot of this home broadcasting began. Certainly for me in a, in a different country and the fact that I couldn't, you know, and I was in the EU and all Brexit and all that shit happened and all that sort of stuff. And I couldn't get back to the UK during COVID. So... Um, it was clear that life was going to change and travel was going to become less. So I, I decided I had to set things up. So the first one I had was a little corner of my rented house. Um, I didn't have a door on it, believe it or not. Uh, and it sort of gave onto my living room. So I had to try and put a curtain across for when, for when I was working, and, you know, people knocking on the door so I couldn't hear them. But I did sort of soundproof it. I had little bits of foam you find in a, a sound recording studio up there. Suddenly, I remember the, the autumn tour de France of 2020. I think the first stage I did like on the kitchen table or something like that. And I remember having ordered these two desks hastily on Amazon because they were the people that delivered. I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't use that thing, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it was the only thing that was delivering back at the time. Um, and I was, instead of doing my research the next day, 
I was doing a bit of DIY and I was putting together these two desks that were going to become my office then for the rest of the tour and the next three years. Um, and it was, you know, a very hastily done, but it worked in the end. And I've transferred a lot of that here to, to where I live now, just around the corner. And, and the most important thing is you have to have bulletproof internet. You have to have fantastic internet. Otherwise, it's never going to work, is it? So that that's very important. Uh, and that's the best investment you can make. The lip mic that you guys talked about is is the next thing because that that gives you sound quality with these things designed to work in football stadiums. And I've used them at the Winter Olympics in all sorts of different venues with people shouting and screaming next to me when there's been speed skating on and things like that. So even in an indoor venue with a lot of people shouting and screaming, it works really well. So I have this. I have other microphones to record voiceover for different bits of work, a bit like what you gentlemen are using there, sort of sit up voiceover mics. Um, and I have two desks, sort of an L shape. You guys are looking at me now through my big screen where I normally watch the pictures, and that's the biggest screen I have. So I have a big desktop, com desktop computer with a big screen. Underneath that, I have a box. I'm holding it up now. And this is a box I invested in back back during the the height of the pandemic and it basically allows me to plug all my recording equipment in send that signal to the computer receive the sound back and sort of hear in a bit of more of a professional way rather than listening on you know a pair of uh, headphones that I'd maybe use on my phone or something like that to listen to music when I was out running um, and then I've got a laptop computer which I use to usually have stats and things like that up other information I have a big iPad, and on that, what we do is usually establish video contact. So I have a video call with a lot of people I'm working with. We generally have, now that we have these broadcasts of several people, we have a bit like a video chat room, like we have now, so you maybe have four or five screens on. And Jens saw this with us when we were working together at the Giro d'Italia at the Tour de France. You know, we could see each other wherever we were. And at the tour this year, I was here. We had commentators in one part of London, commentators in another part of London, people on site as well. So it was really important that we could see each other to try and avoid as much as possible talking over each other. I've got a printer here for printing start sheets out. I try not to um, kill too many trees nowadays. And thankfully, because with all these screens, you don't really need to print all the information out now. But it's always good to have a, a start list. That's the one from the Vuelta Burgos today with a bit of scribbling on it. You can see that Primoz Roglic there, we're in number one. All sorts of names on there. Um, and then I'll print out my big notes that I talked about. They'll stay there for the three weeks with lots of scribbles on it by the end of the three weeks. And there we have it. And I also have a little stand in front of me with a mobile phone because obviously a lot of people might wonder, well, what about the technicians? Well, your own technician. You are your own technician at home. Thankfully, with help on WhatsApp groups that when things go wrong, technically, we talk to each other on and things like that. So it is possible. It's just a completely different way of working. Um, and and yeah, I have the door shut. I, I have the blinds closed behind me, bits of foam up. I have a couple of pictures and things like that, of things that are important to me. I've got a musette from an old team frame there, some tour winners. I've got Blackburn Rovers Premier League champions, all the stats from when they won the Premier League in 1995. That's my team that's in the second division of English football now that's unfortunately never going to win again. Um, pictures up here of colleagues as well and friends. Um, and books. I've got a few books up here as well. I've got the Garibaldi from the last year, Giri d'Italia up there. I've got a a guide to Italy and France as well for very slow days when not much is happening and I need to know what's going on and where we are. So, yeah, that's generally it. And usually there's a couple of empty coffee cups around me on a busy day as well. And I can see uh, your headphones. Yes. Huh? They must be standard Eurosport equipment because yes, I, have I have the those. same, correct? Yes. Standard issue. Yes, it is. I have my, my standard issue headphones on. They're very, very so good headphones, actually. How Absolutely. How tech-savvy you have to be. I mean, when I sometimes commentate out of the office with my friend here in Berlin, sometimes the internet drops, and then you go, okay, is it a problem with Eurosport? Is it in Paris, or is it here in Berlin the problem? So you got to have a minimum of knowledge about these sort of things, right? Or how, how is that for you? What do you do if the screen turns black? What do you do? Panic. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> thankfully, it doesn't happen too much. No, there, there's a, obviously, first of all, you check it's not you. You do an internet test. The thing is, as well, I'm very lucky to live in an area where there's 5G mobile phone coverage. So if there's a problem, I have that as backup. So that's another reason why I always keep my phone in front of me as well. Um, I used to have a, a different router as well, but I think it's much quicker, actually, the, the signal on the phone nowadays. Uh, so it's actually quite good to have that. So I'd just plug that in and get back on straight away if there's an issue with, with the internet. But yes, it's usually asking questions. And I think you know if it's a problem you're in pretty quickly. That, that, that's quite good. You sort of get you get uh, an idea as how these things work, how each program works. You know, we, we use it almost every day now for weeks and weeks on end and then months and months on end. They're long seasons now, aren't they? So, um, so yeah. Rob, I can tell very easily that you're an extremely passionate person. Um, that comes through in your voice. It comes through in your mannerisms. What really excites you about the sport? I mean, you've commentated on so many races, seen so many things, good times and bad times. What is it that really gets you going? The journey and the drama, I would say. Um, and I think that's what most people would hook on to. The, the great thing about cycling is there's so many different angles to attack it with and get into it with. You've got people who are interested in the numbers which is completely valid as well. It's just as valid as people who don't know about the numbers, aren't interested in the equipment, but are sitting at home and wanting to know, well, this person's beaten this person. Why hasn't she beaten her or he beaten him? What's happening today? And then the, another valid approach is people sitting at home and saying, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, look at that mountain there. It's absolutely beautiful. I couldn't get up there. Actually, maybe I could. I'll book a holiday there next year. That's what I love about this particular sport, the different angles. But what gets me really interested is a story and a journey. So that's why I think, you know, as much as I'm interested in track cycling, I think road is something that I'm interested in, you know, an A to B, um, have a look at those beautiful mountains on the way whilst watching something unfold. Um, and, and that's the great thing about a three week tour, isn't it? It's like a soap opera. You're tuning in every day for an episode and what's going to happen. Who's going to say what? Uh, who's going to go back to the car and do this? What funny thing's going to happen today? What sad thing? What what joyous thing? Um, and it, it is a journey and, and it's a sort of reflection of life. And yeah, it might be being a bit too pretentious and profound there, but it's sort of true, isn't it? In a, in a, in a roundabout way, because you're watching people do something that is absolutely ridiculous to the extreme for three long weeks and anything can happen people can get sick people can do well people can fall off people can produce the performance of their life they can have the best and worst day on the in their lives out there on the bike and so much is happening and so much else is happening that we don't know about but you know that what's happening in someone's personal life private life and again we don't want or need to know that but they're all sort of things that affect the performance and affect what you see in front of you and not everything's black or white. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of gray area. And, and I guess that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Just, just watching these things unfold and enjoying them, whether they're good or bad, or you're indifferent to them. So now we, we talked about commenting, how it works. And, you know, some people are more interested in the numbers or not. And, of course, reception people have of us is differently, right? For some, yes, you talk way too much about the numbers. For the other one, oh man, they talk about the cheese in the castles. I want to know everything <laughs> about the numbers. So I would say for you, it must be the same. Or for me, I get, I would say 90 to probably 95% pure positive comments. But 5%, they can be so vicious. Like you go, how dare you say that? Did you have any of that as well? And you, you did quit uh, Twitter, didn't you? I got rid of it, yeah. Um, I think I was very lucky. I didn't get too much of it, but the little bit of it did seriously affect me. It ruined my day, mainly because I wondered how people could be so could be so nasty. Maybe I'm being a bit naive, but how people could be so horrible and vindictive and nasty to care so much to write. And yeah, I'm not on too much social media now. I do a little bit of Instagram just to mess about and put some pretentious, nice looking pictures up. That's about it, really. It's started as a personal thing and I never sort of made it private. But uh, but even now you get somebody who'll hunt you down and search you to say, oh, you know, you got this slightly wrong or you said that or why. And it's like, wow, 
you really wasted five seconds of your life to do that. Um, and that that's what I get that people are passionate. It's great that people are passionate. You know, people, we don't want people to be indifferent about, about the sport, but there's a line, isn't there? <laughs> there? There are people who are people and people have feelings and people are just doing their best. And again, I, um, I, yeah, I just, I don't talk too much. I keep myself to myself off air. Um, so it's probably nice that you, you know, you explain and I've explained, I haven't chat with you guys about what work that goes into it, the amount of work that goes into it, because we don't just turn up and talk and we care about doing a good job. That, that, that's the thing that, that can hurt you, isn't it? Because I know that, you know, when you turn it on, you, you care about entertaining people and, and telling people about your experiences and applying what you think. And you can have a bad day. I can have a bad day. We all have shit days at work, don't we? We have shocking days at work. Um, but unfortunately, every word of ours is recorded and every word is scrutinized. And yeah, you know, it's, um, we're, we're very lucky to do what we do, uh, but we also work hard doing what we do. Yeah, this uh, live live commentary, I, I've often thought that, man, you have to be so conscious of what you're saying at all times, uh, not not mentioning just mispronouncing a word, but just some tiny little mistake and then get flamed after it um, can't be can't be easy at all. But so you started commentating in cycling in 2007. So you've been around the sport for quite a while. Um, yeah. Are you allowed or do you allow yourself to have a favorite rider, a favorite team, a favorite um, piece of memorabilia? And if so, what what are those? Um, not really. I, I think you, naturally as people, there are people who – and it's difficult. It's a really difficult question, this, Bobby, because obviously when you're on air – you have to be impartial and people are always going to hear things. People are always going to hear things and think that and they do this. I mean, soccer is the worst sport for this footballs, you know, that commentator hates my team because he said this and they were probably just stating a fact, you know, and, and I get that. I get, I get, and, and the big thing obviously is, you know, you're pro this team, you're pro this team, that, that team, you're pro this rider, you're pro that rider. You, you hate my rider. Actually, no. Because when you're commentating, you really are impartial. You state facts, and sometimes facts, and someone hasn't won for a long time, that that can annoy them. And I know with, with certain riders, it has annoyed them as well because they've had their families at home watching, and they've said to you after, and then you've got dogs abuse for it after. But sorry, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving out the statistic. It doesn't. I might inside. I might be thinking if I do have a sort of feeling for that person, I think, oh god, I don't really want to say this, but. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, you know, you, you sort of lay in the law and the land the, or the lie of the land rather um, by, by saying what has happened previously. And, you know, you, let's say you're setting up a sprint finish and all oh, this sprinter on a roll at the minute, five out the last wins, six stages have been wins. And then you've got someone else who hasn't won for a year and you don't want to say it because, you know, you want them to win deep down, but no, you can't let that affect you. Um, for that reason, I've not really tried to have that too many sort of personal relationships with with riders while they're still riding. Obviously, it happens that you bump into some people and people are friendly to you and you're, you know, you have a nice relationship with them. Uh, but you can't really let that affect things, no, because you wouldn't be doing your job properly, would you? Well, I, I remember when somebody asked me a question, like in my job as as expert, I go, I love the guy, but... My job is expert and I have to say, no, he's probably not going to win because of this and this and this. And it hurts sometimes. But like you say, you do the job, you try to be objective and neutral and say it in a way that every spectator, every viewer understands. Ah, okay. If he puts it that way, it makes sense. But yes, sometimes it's hard. I know, I know. And, you know, and obviously with cycling being cycling, eras being eras, there are certain riders that if they won and we were on the microphone we would get abuse for them winning and us just saying this person won, you know, but by the same token, whatever's happened in the past, if that person's racing and they're allowed to race, of course you're going to call the victory like it, you know, your job is to call the victory or call the whatever's happening and, and announce whatever's happening, you know, commentate on, on what's happening in front of you. So it can be difficult to, 
to get over those things when when people get so angry. But again, I would never want people's passion for the sport to go away as well. It just perhaps has to be directed in a more positive and meaningful and thoughtful way. But you're often commentating on life-changing moments for the athletes that are on your screen, men and women. Um, so that that's passion can really come out because yeah. you feel that this is going to change this person's life. He's never won a stage of the tour. She hasn't won a stage of the Tour de France Femme. This is something special. But you also have to commentate during some of the darkest moments of our sport. Um, crashes, um, sicknesses, people, guys dropping out, crying on the side of the road, or even dying. And I don't know if I can ask this, but the way that you had to commentate during the Gino Mater tribute was amazing. I don't know how I could have done that because the entire time I would have been very conscious of making a mistake. But the way that you honored him and you're commentating that day was honestly the reason why we wanted to have you on this podcast because that showed something more than just piss and vinegar and excitement and, and mm. facts, but the humanism, um, the character and the class in which you dealt with that scenario was amazing. Um, but how, how did you get through, how do you get through those hard moments? Well, first of all, thanks for your really kind words. They're, they're lovely words. Um, Honestly, how do you get through it? I've had to do it too many times. That's the really sad thing about it. it never gets easier, and there's always emotion in it. But the the first thing, and you know, this is a this is a reminder to everybody that we should always strive for it to be safer. There are always going to be horrible things happening, unfortunately, because it's just the nature of what what the sport is isn't it but you know where it can be avoided let's keep working to avoid it that's the first point because i think i've had to do it too many times um the other thing i think you have to be professional yes you have to show emotion but you always you also can't show as much as you want to do because you have to be respectful as you say and you have to keep that there's a part of your brain that's that's bought broadcast you know being a professional broadcaster and I think this, I'll go back to something that I said early on in the chat when I said that I think it was important that if you're, um, if you're a bro you know, any sort of broadcaster, you have to do different things. So if I'm a cycling commentator, yes, that is 90% of my job. But the fact that I did, I worked for the BBC at the Olympics, for example, for the last few Olympics and Paralympics and uh, I did the Winter Olympic Games, things like that, that helps because I'm on air. And I, I go back to something about, it's all about managing tone. I think that from a sort of pure professional, I'm talking broadcast technique here in those instances. Um, it's all about managing tone. And I think that there was a, um, an absolute superstar. There's a couple of superstars at the BBC. Um, when we were doing the Winter Olympics, there were a couple of horror stories on in the news. That, and the way that these broadcasters who are the presenters of the programme changed the tone from talking about real horrific things real things that mattered to talking about sport that yes we love it as sports fans but doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things does it yes of course it's great to watch but you know when there are wars happening and there's economic crisis there's people who can't pay the bills there's all sorts of horrible things happening in the world the way they change the tone to that and being involved in those broadcasts and having to react to that whether it be at 4 a.m in the morning three in the afternoon or 10 o'clock at night uh, they are experiences, I think, that, that that stand you in very good stead to react as a broadcaster to to different um, different scenarios. So I think that 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 is you know sort of learning on the job, prior experience and training get gets you through things. So I would always any young broadcaster that always asks me for when they ask me for for advice, I said don't just stick to one thing as as a lead broadcaster as a 
a main commentator, you should have other experience, I think. And that that's that's the thing that helps you get through that. And the other, again, how do you survive it? How do you get through it? If I'm being honest, Bobby, I, I wasn't in a great place those days. I was struggling a little bit. Um, won't go into it too much more because it's not really about me, that story, you know, the, the, um, not, not about me at all. It's about the, his family and friends and teammates. And, you know, I had a, a lovely message from the doctor and people like that. And the that's when you that's when it hits home how many people were involved and how many people were there and that sport basically means bugger all when it compared to to awful things like that happening so for that reason you have to get it right um for that reason you have to be respectful and uh, I, I i wish i could articulate better uh for you now, I know it's my job to do that. Conversely, but I wish I could articulate better Th- those moments. I suppose I try not to remember too much of them because they're, they're not very nice memories. But yeah, I, I thank you for your nice comments and and they're, yeah, they weren't easy days. They weren't easy days to be honest. And um, yeah, you talk to people, talk to your friends, your family, loved ones, and um, they help you through it as well. So let's maybe try to move on to the other side of the emotions. <laughs> Did you have a moment where you just sit in your uh, commentator booth or box and go, pinch me? Did I just saw history written? Or did you have a moment where you go, oh my God, did he or she just had a comeback? Did you have a moment like that then for us to share? Lots of moments like that. Certainly in the last few years, and I think you guys will agree. I mean, I think there's some people out there who think that I'm over hype and over egg, but we've had so many big stories in the last few years. This sport has seen some incredible performances and moments in the last few years. Recently, the most recent moment, I would say, and there's, again, there's plenty, there's Fondapool in Amstel, there's Roglic and Pogaccia upon Planche de Belfi. The most recent one is last time trial of the Giro. Me and Sean Kelly turn around to each other. And Sean and I have been very lucky to spend a lot of time together over the last decade or so. We've commentated on probably far too many hours of bike racing for a lot of people's liking. <laughs> um, and we just turn around to each other and we were still live, but you know, we just sort of mouthed swear words to each other. Like as if to say, did we really just see that? I mean, that was incredible. And and again, there were so many emotional bits to add to that, but in terms of just the sport and the riding that you'd seen, you're like, Oh my God, it's really happened. And you prepare for it. You know, you prepare for what might happen. I think, you might have an idea of how you react. And so it doesn't surprise you. It doesn't shock you, but the way it did happen, it did probably shock everybody, didn't it? And that's one of countless ones. And going back to the fond of pool thing in Amstel, I was with Matt Stevens at the time. Uh, I was working for the Holds broadcaster that day on site. And I always remember that because Matt was laughing whilst we were still on air. That's how incredulous he was. He just could not believe it. And looking across It was the closest thing I've ever seen at a cycling event to being in a football ground when you score a goal that wins the league or the cup or the the World Cup. The old Dutch fans, Dutch champion, the last name that he has as well. The fact that it had been donkey's years since a Dutch man had won that race. And it was like they'd just scored the winning goal in the World Cup final. Maybe they'd had a few glasses of the sponsor's tipple as well to oil them up over the afternoon but the roar was just incredible and 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 again looking at Matt just laughing next to me he just could not believe what he said it was that was pretty incredible as well well so you do the same sort of recon the same sort of research mm. that a director sportif does You know, you're looking at the Grand Tours as soon as they're released. You're studying the courses. You're studying the riders. I don't know. Maybe you're on Strava looking at KOMs or QOMs before the race. You're on the Weather Channel looking at weather. You're on Velo Viewer looking at sprint finishes. Have you ever thought, why can't I be a DS? I probably have more research experience than than any of these guys does that ever could that ever happen that someone like you a lead commentator would step in out of the booth and into the ds chair or uh should we just make that like a 
a challenge. <laughs> um, if I'm being completely honest, Bobby, it has never, ever crossed my mind that thought. I'm quite happy in broadcasting for the moment, but um, never say never to a change of career, I guess. Uh, honestly, um, I don't know how welcoming the world would be to that sort of thing. I think that might still be a bit old fashioned. And I think that's not just um, a take on cycling. I think that many sports are like that. You see coaches who haven't played the game at the top level or, you know, things like that. I, there's been very successful ones, but they've always come up against a bit of bit of a buff. And you probably have to have a bit of a thick skin to get through that. And that's not something that I really have, unfortunately. I'm far too much of a sensitive soul sometimes for all that sort of stuff. Uh, so I don't think I would get into that. But, I mean, the prep for me differs depending on who I'm working with. If I know who I'm working with, then, you know, like, uh, so Adam Blythe, who's new new with us in the last year, is very good as well. Adam loves Veloview. So I know that part of it, I can sort of leave to him because he's going to be watching it throughout the race. Dan Lloyd is the expert at looking at all the Strava segments and things like that. So I know that if I'm with Dan, you know, um, and I've got limited time the day before and we've, you know, got a seven hour broadcast, I'll probably spend that time doing something else. Same with on the time trials. He's really good at looking at the time checks. But So I try my best to get the best out of the person who's next to me. I see that as one of the big pillars of my job. Um, and, and, you know, I've commented a few times with Jens and I will always try and ask you a question and point something to you to get you involved because, you know, the viewers want to hear the experts talking about the things. So I think a big part of our job is to get that. But yeah, the research is, is always something to fall back on, isn't it? And it's like your comfort blanket. If you start a broadcast without it, you're going to be nervous all the time. Hey, um, I have a question Um, it just came to my mind more or less um, already half an hour ago, I guess. If you could ever choose to be reborn and commentate, would you choose to be with Charlie Gowell, Eddie Merckx, Bernard Hino, commentate the Tour de France of 89 with Lament and uh, um, Laurent Fignon? Or are you happy now? I, I think we live in the best time cycling ever had. If you could choose, what time would you choose to be a commentator? Depends if you're motivated, what your motivation is. If you're motivated by money, then probably that 80s, 90s era, I would say. Uh, talking to a few colleagues. Uh, if you're motivated by watching the absolute spectacle of what we see now, which I think most of us are, oh, come on, we're enjoying it. No, I really wouldn't change it. There's part of me that thinks, oh, the era of, you know, um, the famous Italian commentary line, c'è un uomo al comando. You know, it's Fausto Coppi and all that sort of stuff. That'd be sort of that's the romantic era, isn't it? Of going in and having an espresso and then dialing into the phone line for the radio and saying, Yep, Coppi's here, 16 minutes and counting, nobody else is over the pod show yet, you know. Um, that sort of thing is quite romantic, isn't it? And I guess they were the broadcast pioneers. But yeah, with all the technology now, the way the racing is, I would not change it at all. I agree. I mean, I'm, I, can't believe from my couch that Jens and I used to do this sport because it just is a totally <laughs> so many of you guys are saying that sport. at the minute you know yeah yeah no I like, mean I, I, like Bobby and me at our best we wouldn't even be top 100 in the tour not even top 100 unbelievable yeah. these days yeah. it, so many it, of you guys are saying it goes that. against so many things that we were taught you know that Young riders can't do a grand tour, you know, until they're, you know, middle, mid twenties, right? Uh, you don't do two grand tours or especially three grand tours in the same season. Yeah. You know, it's except because he's going to do his fifth in a row Kursi's now, I think. going to do yeah. it. Our American boy's going to do it. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm sure he's going to do well as well, but um, no, we are living in, we, we are blessed to be watching cycling with the riders in both the men in the women's peloton that are giving us such exciting racing. And we're blessed to have people like you, Rob, and you, Jens, that are helping get that word out to the sport and convey the excitement that people like Jens and I actually are scared of now. But Rob, we're going to let you get back to your, your dinner. You got another stage of tour of Bur Burgos tomorrow. And then, very quickly on the heels of that, I'm sure the tour of Spain. So thank you so much for sitting down with us and showing us, giving us a little glimpse behind the scenes 
of what it takes for you to do your job. So thank you so very much for coming on, Bobby and Jens. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, you won't hear me on the Tour of Spain this year. I'm not uh, on the Tour of Spain team, but uh, I will be doing Benelux next and then some Canadian racing. I'll be back for all the Italian classics as usual at the end of the year. But I might actually, you know, take a trip to the Tour of Spain as a punter. I might take my bike. Uh, my partner lives in Asturias, so maybe I'll even go and have a go at the Angliru. I might need to lose a few kilos first, but I might have a go at that, eh? <laughs> And a triple chain ring. Hey, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question for the Commonwealth people here. Did you, as a commentator, commentator in different sports, did you ever had a chance to say, and he is out for Golden Duck? Did, did you ever <laughs> eyewitness that? No, um, I love that sport, but unfortunately, I never, ever got the chance to commentate on cricket. No. Oh, bummer. I thought you would maybe had a bit of a start there no no that one was left behind back in in lancashire i still watch certainly england and australia and the ashes and things like so it's the only sport i still support england in i'm that i'm that little being british now that's the only sport i still support england in but there you go um so yeah an absolute pleasure chatting to you guys thanks very much for having me and uh, really lovely to have a nice evening chat well that's all our time for this week huge thank to rock for being our guest Thank you for listening. Please give us a five-star review and don't forget to share us with your friends. The show was a Velo production in association with Shocked Giraffe. The producer was Mark Payne and this episode was edited by Kirk Warner. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook. Just head to at Bobby and Jens and send your cycling questions to us. Rob spoke about his love of the Giri Italia. But what's your favorite race? Let us know, please, by messaging us at Bobby and Jens on social media.